and welcome to the Actual Astronomy Podcast, episode number 33. And uh, Shane, you said <laughs> I should apologize for my poor audio quality. I'm not in my usual uh, recording spot. <laughs> where, where, where are you, Chris? <laughs> I'm down in the grasslands on, uh, on very limited uh, bandwidth here. Um, just actually looking out at the at the buttes from uh, just a place I rented for a few nights. And yeah, I mean, you know, it's not going to be clear tonight. Doesn't really look like it, but last night was pretty good. So uh, sounds like your plans got a bit skunk. We were both going to come down here. And then because of the COVID-19 and some business changes, there wasn't the camping availability, I guess you were saying. Yeah, yeah. So you're staying at one of the small sort of resort properties, I guess, uh, right near Grasslands. And you and I have camped there many times in the past. And my mm. plan was to just bring my tent and, and camp in the in their little area. But they're no longer offering tenting. They just rent, uh, I think there's two or three rooms that they have in there. Um, yeah. And that's it. Uh, so I thought, well, you know, my option would be to stay in the park. But you know, from that from that resort site, it's, that's a probably about a 20 minute drive, I'm guessing, maybe even a little bit more into the park. Yeah, probably more like, yeah, half an hour anyway. Yeah. yeah. So because of that, I, I didn't think you and I would actually hook up to observe because, you know, one of the nice things of going to grasslands is you basically walk out of your tent or, you know, and if you're at the resort, you walk out to your door, you know, you mm. observe until you can barely keep your eyes open and then you walk 10 feet to your bed. And that's, yeah. you know, one of the best aspects of it. Uh, not, so not drive half an hour through a field, which may or may not have bison roaming through it. Oh, and antelope. And, you know, it, it's kind of the Saskatchewan Serengeti out there. It really is. It yeah. really is. I really had some of those experiences today. Yeah. Yeah. I want to hear more about that. Um, so anyway, I, I thought, you know what? Uh, so Grasslands National Park is split into two halves. There's West Block, where you're, which is where you are at. And then there's mm -hmm. East Block, which is a little closer to uh, where you and I both live. So I thought, you know what? I think because, you know, we wouldn't be observing together anyway, I'm just going to go to the closer place, which was East Block. Uh, my plan was to go Friday, Saturday night. Uh, Friday was you know, quite wet and rainy. So I did not want to drive down there just to sleep in my tent and experience did, a rainstorm. Did you see the photo? I did. Did you get the photo? I text you of the funnel cloud. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, my plan was to go down Saturday night, you know, do one night. Um, but the forecast was just looking a little questionable, you know, it was saying partly cloudy and even the wind, it was supposed to be around 20 kilometers per hour, which yeah. I don't mind observing in 20 K winds, but you know, if it's any faster than that or like any stronger than that, um, I'm not too interested in observing. So, you know, because of that questionable forecast, I, you know, I didn't want to drive three hours one way just to, again, you know, sleep in a tent and then go home the next day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I can understand that. Um, yeah, it was pretty good last night though. Uh, you know, when we, my wife actually came up because, you know, with the uh, Comet Neowise now being so bright, and it really is, um, and then with the planets, uh, Jupiter and uh, Saturn, uh, basically around opposition for both of them, um, you know, that's, in my opinion, a, a pretty, you know, good evening, maybe, maybe like an evening that you'd always sort of dream about. So I was like, you know, you really should come up and take a look. So she actually came up and she couldn't believe how um, like she's not into astronomy at all. And she was just really impressed with how much fun it was when, you know, you have these two planets rated opposition and you could really see some detail on them and this comet there and the Milky Way streaming overhead. And I'm like, oh yeah, like this is like one of those nights, you know, like I said, you really, you really dream about. We did have some low cloud to the south and kind of impeded the views down there. And actually, you know, it's funny, I was looking and I think we had you know, like a bit of a planning session for our last podcast. And then uh, I actually really didn't follow too much of that plan at all. <laughs> so, Well, you know, that happens. And I think you and I both talked about observing uh, objects in Scorpius, which if you lost some of the south with cloud, mm -hmm. you might not even have been able to uh, see any of that stuff anyway. So sometimes you just have to pivot. Yeah. And I, I did take a look at uh, like Messier 4 and you know, I could just barely see, and, and then, which is a globular cluster. Um, and then I could just barely see a globular cluster called NGC 6144. And if I can't see that well, 
um, then I, I really don't, don't take my observations down. So, uh, at least in that region of the sky. So, you know, I decided at that point that I would just kind of focus on the comet, you know, I thought, well, gee, you know, next month, most of Scorpius will still be there, but you know, this comet uh, is likely not going to be as impressive as it is or as it, you know, at present. So I thought, man, I'm just going to focus on that. And I was really happy I did, you know, I did, I think three or four drawings of it and had some really good uh, observations. So have you been able to get out and look at the comet Neowise again? Not again. Uh, I just have the one observation where I went north of our city with um, my little William Optic 60 millimeter as well as 12 by 36 binoculars. And uh, that's it. But I really enjoyed the views. Like I can't get over how big it is and how bright it was then. Um, yeah. How, how has it evolved? Like, so you've observed it a few times now. Um, yeah. How... So the first time I observed it seemed pretty good. And then I almost never, like, a, well, I went out, I think the morning after you were out, and it was uh, really muted. It seemed like it had gone down in brightness. We had some cloud, but it had fog the, the first night. So I thought it's, it's about comparable conditions. Uh, but now it's just almost a whole different ball game. It is so bright now. Uh, it's pretty crazy. Um, I'm not sure what the magnitude estimates are uh, right now, but I mean, you know, for anybody familiar with, not really to compare it to deep sky objects or anything, but like it's, you know, many times brighter than the uh, Andromeda galaxy, for example. Wow. And Andromeda, you know, that's a, that's bright. <laughs> yeah. So it's, you know, it's like by far, it's brighter than, you know, most regions of the Milky Way, maybe like the Scutum star cloud um, collectively might be a little brighter, but yeah, it's, it's pretty much, you know, apart from like planets and the moon and the sun and such, it's, it's the brightest thing. And apart from Milky Way, it's the biggest thing up there. I, measured the tail out at uh, originally even just getting out of the car um, I could see it as 10 degrees and my wife could see it as about five and then uh, by the time we were out there for half an hour and we're fully dark adapted um, I was easily able to get it 15 and I really think I was getting it about 20 degrees which is two fists uh, two fists at arm's length and she was getting it at about 10 or 12 degrees at that point so uh, she's not an amateur astronomer or experienced astronomers so that kind of gives gives the scale of how big this is and i think that's much larger than hale bop's tail hale bop was much brighter in 97 which was a really bright comet in 97 um but at a short tail and then there was hack attack uh, the year before in 96 which had a huge tail and was a much larger and perhaps in some ways uh, a more impressive comet both of them than than this one but this one's definitely um in some ways it's like the classic comet right mm -hmm. uh, being in, in like just how it looks like whereas Hale Bob was just small and so bright um, and from what I've seen in like you know sort of older photos and sort of ancient wood carvings and that sort of thing it, it definitely does this one definitely does look more like what I would always have thought of as a classic comet which is you know fairly bright but then has this this huge beautiful uh, tail um, it's just phenomenal it's the tail is so long and what sets it apart for me from uh, comic Min, comet McNaught from a couple of years ago. Uh, well, more than a couple of years ago, but uh, the, you know, that's one of the more recent kind of bright, you know, beautiful comets is the, the tail of uh, Neo wise, you know, has that sort of widening V to it, you know, whereas I yeah. felt like McNaught was more of a line, like a straighter line, like it, it expanded and it had some contour, but it yeah. compared to Neo wise, like you said, it really is just like, if you were to draw a comet, uh, just to what you think it should look like, you would draw Neo wise. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and, you know, again, there's, there's a few things with it, I think, that make it just look so spectacular. So it does look pretty good with the unaided eye. But, you know, once you uh, put binoculars on it or a telescope, uh, especially now, the telescope views are really coming um, pretty phenomenal. So my four inch using a 12 and a half millimeter eyepiece, uh, I can't remember what power that is, but uh, anyway, <laughs> just off the top of the head, well, it'd be, um, oh, maybe like 50 power or something like that. Yep. Anyway, and, and the views through that were just astounding. Um, like this beautiful nucleus and then around it, like this beautiful, almost circular coma. 
and then it kind of just jets back and there's this really bright section that's about maybe four or five degrees. So right now, the, the section that is just crazy bright is about as big as, as the whole thing looked uh, through a telescope, I think just, just a week or so ago. Um, and then now there's like the rest of it, which is about as, as bright as it was a week or so ago too. And, uh, and it just trails off. Now, through binoculars, my binoculars are really wide field. They're almost 10 degrees. And this, uh, you know, binoculars are a great thing to look at comets through. And uh, I could see um, more tail than I could fit in the field of view of my comet uh, binoculars. Wow. So which binoculars are those? These are just like my inexpensive, like $120 Nikon Action oh. Extremes. Yeah. Right, right. So they're, they're like a nine or almost a 10 degree uh, binocular field. And you can use them with glasses. They're, they're pretty inexpensive binoculars as far as binoculars go. But really, this is, you just want a wide field for this. And yeah, it was pretty astounding. And then with the telescope on it, yeah, just unbelievable just how bright it was. And with the 12 and a half millimeter eyepiece, I could even see the ion tail, which is the, uh, what, what is it exactly? It's the ionized particles and it points directly straight back from the sun. Like it's a straight line yeah. versus the actual tail of the comet, which are the uh, volatile particles. Then they, they point more or less back, but they start to go into orbit around the sun. So then they kind of fan out like, like you were saying, but uh, yeah, with the four inch and uh, like I said, maybe around 50 power or so, I was able to see both both the tails, which surprised me because I didn't know. I, I don't really, you know, something might sound strange, but I don't really read that much about astronomy online unless I've seen something. And I'm just kind of going out, you know, blank slate and uh, taking a view for myself. So uh, I was really surprised to see that ion tail, and I actually was reluctant to to mention it that I that I saw it. So I did look it up, and it's definitely there. And I don't know if other people are reporting that they've seen it or not, but it was there in the astrophotos. But the astrophotos, they're not really doing it justice in, into how large it is. Uh, to have a comet with a near 20 degree uh, tail under, under a perfectly dark sky is uh, an exceptionally rare event. Um, so only Hakatake had uh, as long or maybe just a slightly longer, I think it was maybe 30 or 40 degrees or maybe even longer, but uh, that was, exceptionally rare and this one is is pretty much just as rare like you know good chance you could go rest of your life and never see a comet with with a tail that big but you know unfortunately we only observe just inside the park um kind of said like i really wish you had driven down i probably would have driven in to observe with you because the uh i think the tail would have been just that much better from from the pure darkness right inside the park um you forget how a truly dark location is impacted by light and, until you get back out here. Like for example, we're 12 kilometers or whatever that is seven or eight miles from um, the nearest town or village. And they actually are dark sky compliant with full cutoff lights. So you can see maybe six or eight lights and they're, they're dim because we're up higher, I think maybe by uh, hundred to 150 feet above the town. And, uh, Anyway, like if a car was driving into town from from outside and had its high beams on, it, they seem ridiculously bright even from, you know, like I said, about a dozen kilometers away. And you you forget uh, how much light impacts a truly dark location like that. It's it's pretty wild. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it's funny you say that because I was talking to my wife a little bit about grasslands and and uh, just on the weekend here. And, I'm you know, I had that conversation with her that when you're in such a dark place because she she couldn't understand why I would kind of be worried about other campers you know maybe walking to the washroom with a flashlight and I said you know when you're in such a dark place any little bit of light is like amplified because it's just so dark down there um, any any unnatural light or white light really really bothers you more than you know a lot of other locations yeah um, and people tend to be kind of sort of oddly roving around a little bit more, it seemed anyway. Oh. I was kind of surprised, you know, having spent a lot of nights down here. And I think it's just because like, they can't really go into the stores as much. And like the town here is pretty locked down. So I think people tend to be kind of up and about a little bit more. 
Well, and uh, I, th I think a lot of astrophotographers were heading down to, well, even just general photographers were heading down to grasslands this weekend to try to uh, get some comet images from what I've heard. Yeah, but yeah, but even just regular folks, I could kind of tell they weren't doing any astronomy. They were just kind of roving around a bit more than usual. And mm -hmm. my experience down here, especially at night, right? Like one o'clock in the morning, I kind of saw people sort of just sort of driving around a bit. I mean, maybe they were just like going out to take a look at the comet or whatever, but you know, I saw like cars kind of driving and parking and not pointing at the right direction and that sort of thing. So yeah, it was kind of, that was kind of funny, but we also had some really good views of Jupiter in particular. Um, want to mention that, uh, had a good view of the great red spot last night, perhaps when I, I think it may have been the best view I've had, um, through one of my telescopes ever. <laughs> so really, wow. So, uh, is the, does the red seem a little darker this year? Cause the, the color or the, you know, vibrancy or intensity of that great red spot sometimes varies year over year. Yeah. It really seemed quite red to my eye, almost like a orangey red. Like you mm -hmm. think of as Mars red. Um, I was quite surprised. I haven't, I, I had been observing Jupiter uh, five or six weeks ago, but not recently. And like typically the red spot can be uh, rather challenging to see, especially, uh, you know, if you're not really used to looking through telescopes or, or planetary observing, but like my wife, she picked it up no problem at all and kind of was able to, to track and we watched it. Um, we could, when we started observing, it was just coming onto the disc and then we pretty much observed almost uh, long enough that we were able to, to watch it uh, transit right across uh, pretty much the entire disc of Jupiter. So and we were up for, uh, for a couple hours or more um, able to see that. Uh, could see the bands pretty well, like quite a bit of detail there. And uh, Saturn, not as good as I've seen it before. I think, um, you know, just the, the seeing conditions just weren't quite uh, as good for Saturn as they were for Jupiter, which was sort of an interesting thing in itself. And then uh, from time to time, I could see like the Cassini division, but I couldn't like hold it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think some of that has to do with like, you know, Jupiter and the cloud bands are, are very irregular, you know, like there's a lot of striations and, uh, you know, sort of, sort of like rounded off jaggedness within the cloud bands. So mm -hmm. I think Jupiter can sort of, you know, when you're looking at it and seeing isn't quite as crisp as you would like it, it's not as noticeable, but like yeah. Saturn, the lines are so clean on Saturn, especially that Cassini division that yeah. if any, like if it's not a good night of seeing you, I, I just feel like you notice it more on Saturn just because mm. of, again, you know, it's, it's clean lines and, and bad seeing just stands out a lot more on that planet. Yeah. We could see some uh, cloud top detail though. Like we could see a band that was sort of a gray Brown. Okay. Um, so, so we could see that, that, that was kind of neat. We took a, and then like towards the end, we took a brief look at, uh, at Mars <laughs> and it was, it was really shimmery. It was only up about eight or 10 degrees. Uh, yeah. by the time we were, we were thinking about packing down, uh, after 1am and, uh, yeah, it, it was not really a whole lot to, to be seen. It's still a little small and, uh, you know, again, it was just, just rising, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's really kind of, kind of my update in a nutshell that, uh, it was a pretty good night, uh, for the planets and for, uh, Comet Neo wise, uh, boy, people should really get out and try to try to take a peek at it and really try to get out to a dark sky with a good view to the north. Uh, definitely is the best comet that we've had uh, this century so far. Um, and it's a really good one. I think uh, even in the, in the, for the annals of, of uh, astronomy, this, this is a really, really beautiful comet. Yeah, I'm just reading here about some magnitude estimates. Uh, this was just posted maybe a little over an hour ago on cloudy nights. Uh, this person said, I put the brightness uh, way higher than magnitude three last night. Uh, he said Andromeda M31 is about magnitude 3.4. And the comet was much brighter than M31, at least a magnitude and probably more. So yeah, well, you know, not to be too contrary, but you know, uh, people ought not to compare deep, you know, and I, I know I did that at the start, but I kind of did, did put the caveat in, you like, really mm -hmm. ought not to compare them to, to deep sky objects other than more of a general, uh, comparison, are you like, you know, how, how bright is it, you know, sort of in general. 
Um, but as far as like a magnitude estimate goes, yeah, it's, um, you know, the other week I put it at 0.9, um, you know, so it, it definitely has been brighter than, than Andromeda uh, as a magnitude, uh, I think 3.4 object. Um, but I find it's difficult to, to give a magnitude estimate um, for uh, this comet at this point because the tail's so big. Mm -hmm. um, so are you given the estimate for the nucleus or are you given the estimate for, you know, the whole comet? I mean, the nucleus itself um, perhaps is, is uh, of or around uh, somewhere between first and second magnitude. Uh, but then like if you sort of combine the whole light from that whole object, you, you'd probably be uh, looking at a negative uh, one or a zero or something like that. Uh, if you kind of sort of, you know, pieced it all together, it, it really is, uh, quite bright. Again, it's it's definitely the brightest thing in the nighttime sky, apart from uh, Saturn, Jupiter, and, uh, and you know things like that. If you combine them all together, you know that is. But you know, almost the magnitude estimate at this point is inconsequential. Really, want to know is it visible to the unaided eye from you know a city or or any other spot? And you can see it from a city now, and then uh, you know certainly it. Uh, it really is uh, quite a bright comet with a huge tail. So um, kind of once you get into this kind of category of, of comet, I think that uh, one ought not to worry about the magnitude estimate anymore and kind of throw it out the window and just kind of go and make the observations of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting too. You mentioned the ion tail that that's something that people like, if you go out to observe the comet, um, that's something that you should uh, see if you can see And it. It's really just like a second tail uh, and like Chris said, it, you know, it's, it's pointed directly away from the sun. It's very straight versus yeah. the, the big tail is, is definitely like, um, it curves a bit and it's, and it gets pretty fat. Whereas the ion tail, um, because those particles are, they don't really go into orbit around the sun They They just go straight back from the comet, from the sun, like in a perfect, like, you know, linear, geometrical way whereas those other more volatile particles they go into orbit around the sun so they're gonna they're gonna start to fan out a bit more so yeah yeah but uh yeah definitely pretty amazing skies uh these nights i can't wait for mars to be uh coming up a bit higher like i said i really you know it's really too bad the plans didn't work out it would have been great if uh, you mike and others uh, would have been able to to get out here and observe with me i probably would have done an all night session. Um, although it did cloud up eventually and, you know, we got up this morning, it was raining. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure how long those, those really good skies persisted, maybe another hour or so more, but, uh, really is quite amazing to, to be out under them. Yeah. Yeah. So you're likely not able to observe tonight by the sounds of it. Um, yeah, I don't think was, so. Yeah. Is this your last I'm, night there or do you have a, yeah. Night? So yeah, I had to cut it short. I have a medical thing. So right back to that and then maybe uh you know hopefully that isn't too impactful and maybe we can even try to get out uh, this coming weekend um and maybe do some observing maybe closer uh to regina or try to find a spot but i was going to mention like i know you called down to the grasslands and they were they were pretty firm on the on the rules this this year um you know and uh i was talking to our friend caitlin here on, on this side and uh you know, because we go down and we we volunteer a lot of time and energy to uh, help run the programs and do some contracts with them and that sort of thing. So sometimes they uh, will let us go and, and camp in different different places uh, in order to set up our telescopes. And that and we're very appreciative of that when when that's allowed, like in the overflow areas and that sort of thing. When uh, when typically nobody's uh, otherwise using them. And when I was chatting with her, she was like, "Yeah, it's it's a little bit rough this year just because." Um, the rules are so strict with the COVID. Um, they have to, you know, if they have anything unusual as for medical symptoms, they have to go and self isolate and get tested. So it sounds like it's been a little bit, a uh, little bit rough, um, you know, depending. So uh, I can, I can kind of understand that a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah. I had some interesting uh, animal encounters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell, tell me more about that. <laughs> So uh, not really uh, astronomically related, but uh, we're down here, you know, we have these herds of, of bison. Um, some people call them buffalo, but uh, 
uh, regardless. Uh, there, there's two herds and we kind of went for a bit of a walk yesterday in, in the park and had a picnic and, you know, we saw one herd in the distance and they kind of joined up. But I mean, I've seen them really close and often we've seen the bulls really close and lots of other animals around, but we didn't see anything and hardly even have heard coyotes here or anything like that. So really um, kind of low on the on the animal activity. Uh, it's been very wet this year. I'm not sure if that's somehow impacting them or, or what. Um, so then today, you know, it's funny, um, since we've been coming down here, there's always been the warning about the rattlesnakes. And uh, I remember like we'd go to the pub or whatever, and they'd have things on the table like that you could take for rattlesnake warnings and all this stuff. And I've been down here, this is my 10th year um, coming down here, never ever saw a rattlesnake hiked all up over the hills. You and I have hiked up all over the hills and seen tons of different stuff, but never any rattlers. And uh, we decided to just go over to the day use site, which is only a couple miles. And we're not, we're just on the edge of the park here. And uh, get out of the car, we walked maybe 20 meters and there was a rattler about, uh, about a meter or you know, somewhere between you know, maybe up to four feet long. Um, coming through the grass and uh, yeah, diamondback, you know, prairie rattler, whatever they call them. And boy, it was a sizable snake. Um, and uh, when I noticed it and it kind of noticed me, it kind of made a big U-turn and then kind of started coming after us. So we kind of hightailed it out of there. It was a little bit, uh, you know, like they can move pretty quick actually it turns out. So I didn't know they would actually kind of, I don't know what it did. It, did this U-turn and kind of seemed like it was coming at us and we didn't stick around to find out, um, you know, what exactly was, was going to happen. So we just get out of there. Um, but yeah, it was huge. It didn't rattle. Um, but I'm guessing that just people haven't been using that day use site and they kind of have it all broken down. I just thought it was neat because, you know, I hadn't been in there before when there's, you know, no activity. So, um, so that was neat. And then we went up for a hike on 70 mile butte. And one thing I always wanted to see is those, um, I think they're called like a longhorn lizard or something like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can't remember what the name is, but I know it, they're tiny, right? They're like a three inch lizard and yeah. yeah. And so boy, we didn't walk 15 minutes and one ran right in front of me and I took probably 25 or 30 photos of it. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Those, that's a bit of a rare sighting there too. Those. But, those yeah. I think those are pretty rare. Although just being around, I did hear from other people that they were seeing them this year. Although I, again, like with the rattlesnakes and, and these lizards before I've definitely been around where people are saying, Oh, you just missed a giant rattlesnake go through or, you know, all the stuff. And I'd never seen one in 10 years. Um, so finally I saw one, but man, yeah, you do have to watch your step, but you know, you can't let your guard down. As soon as you think, you know, you're not even thinking about anything. You're literally, you know, a mile inside the park, you know, that's when you're going to, you know, find the biggest rattler. Uh, you know, I mean, it was huge, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just, just massive. So, so anyway, but yeah, it looks like some cloud for tonight. So we're just going to take it easy and uh, head home tomorrow, unfortunately. So that's it really for my, for my update, but uh, hopefully this recording goes through again. Uh, my apologies for the audio quality. This, this, uh, you know, it's a neat little spot that they have here, but uh, it's uh, a little bit echoey for sound, I think. Yeah, no, I think it's working out okay. And I'm glad we were able to get this done because otherwise we would uh, probably be a little bit behind in our release schedule. Yeah. Uh, so this is good. Um, you know, I think, I think we should talk just a little bit too about some meteor showers coming up. And uh, oh, yeah, I, I think saw it, lots of meteors last night. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, it kind of dovetails nicely with Neowise as well. Um, mm -hmm. Just because of how these meteor showers originate. So there's multiple meteor showers that happen throughout the year. Um, you know, they're, you can put them on the calendar. We know when they peak. Uh, what we never know is how intense they'll be. Um, so I guess, Chris, how, how, like, what causes a meteor shower? How, do, how did they start? Well, they start out really as comets uh, in orbit around the sun. And then our, uh, our orbit intersects with those orbits. And, as a comet goes around the sun, it gives off this material, like the material you've been talking about from Neowise. And these are like little dust grain to maybe salt grain sized particles. And then as, as Earth intersects with, with comets that uh, share a similar orbit or have shared a similar orbit, many of them don't, don't exist anymore, 
um, we see these particles in our atmosphere and as they burn up, we, we see them as, as meteors. So there's, there's a few, Comet Halley, um, you know, is the parent of the Orionids, uh, which take place in, in or about the third week of, of, of October. Um, we have the Perseids, I think, is it Swift Tuttle that's the parent of the Perseids or something like that? Um, anyway, there's, there's probably, I don't know how many, they've got a few dozen meteor showers every year now, but we're into one, uh, one or two sets right now. I think we're just getting out of the, what are, what are called the Delta Quirids, and then we're gonna go into Perseids here pretty shortly. Yeah, the, the Delta Aquarids uh, peak on July 28th, 29th. Yes. Yeah. Um, the Perseids, August 11th and 12th. Now, that's when they'll be at their highest rate. However, for weeks leading up and a couple weeks after, you'll still see a lot of meteor activity. And, you mm -hmm. know, another name for these are, are shooting stars. You know, that's, uh, I think, kind of what a lot of common uh, references are. Um, and but they aren't anything really to do with stars. They're no. Yeah. And, and what, what I always found amazing, like the first time that I, I learned, you know, what causes a meteor shower is that when you see these streaks of light across the sky, it really is nothing much larger than a grain of sand that's burning up in the atmosphere, um, you know, or, or small, small, small pebbles. Um, you know, the, the brighter ones become, you know, pea sized and cherry sized. And if you see really, really bright ones, it might be the size of a baseball or so. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you're out and you're observing Neowise or anywhere under a dark sky, uh, just be on the lookout for some meteors because there will be, a, a, you know, increased activity over the next, uh, really over the next six weeks or so. Yeah. And uh, this, is, a, this is unconnected to Neowise. It's just coincidental. Yeah, um, it's, it, it's just I, kind I of interesting. Think, I don't think Neowise is on an Earth crossing orbit i know it's outside of earth's orbit now or, or uh, you know will be on the on the 20th i think it crosses the line so yeah. um any idea how long it's going to stay this bright for like i was pretty shocked i was pretty shocked last night when i got out and and how bright it was like it's really bright <laughs> you know yeah. I'm just gonna see here if there's any neowise magnitude well, i'm guessing considering it was it was really good for the past week i think it's at its peak today or tomorrow you know, I'm guessing we probably have until the end of the month. Yeah. Of, uh, I, at least decent observations to make. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, we'll get the moon soon though. And then that of course will impede any, any uh, dark sky observing and, and impede the comet and very likely by the time the moon's out of the sky again. So this is probably it. I mean, this is probably the best week um, right now to, uh, for people to get out and to observe it. So hopefully people will. Yeah, apparently, like I'm looking at a curve right now on the Sky Live, and it placed its magnitude the highest on like June sixth or something like that, and it's uh, dropping off, but like not substantially drop off. Uh, and you know, by yeah, but I think I think like I was saying, those magnitude estimates become suspect once you get yeah. into the the size that we're talking about, like because you know it. it Right now, it's at its closest point to Earth. I think on the 20th is when it's at its closest, July 20th of 2020. That's mm -hmm. pretty big anyway. way. Um, but um, the, you know, the, the comet may have been like, you know, sort of intrinsically slightly brighter. And then because it was further away, it kind of looked sort of smaller in the sky. So it was more concentrated. But now it's so close and so big in our sky that um you know are really getting this phenomenal view even though intrinsically it might not be quite as bright because it's further away from the sun at this time mm -hmm. uh definitely the show is more spectacular uh than it was a week or 10 days ago uh so I'm, you know and you know who knows it could as we as we uh begin you know here in the next couple of days to move away from the comet uh and the comet is moving away from us uh, it could sort of exponentially uh, decrease in brightness, unfortunately, and it could it could really start to to dim down. But I really think that over the course of of the next week, you know, before the uh, uh, before I say the the twenty sixth of July, this this is the time for people to get out and and take a look at it. You know, sometime in the next week or so. Yeah, just reading here, its closest approach to Earth will be July twenty second. Um... And at that point, it'll be almost as far away as Mars. Wow. Yeah. 
Interesting. Yeah. So hopefully people will get a chance to get out and take a look. So I think that's really it for my report, Shane. Do you have anything else to add? No, no. Uh, glad that you're able to get some views in and hopefully we can get out later this week uh, to take a look at the comet and some other things. Sounds good. How can people get in touch with us? Uh, they can find us on Twitter at Actual Astronomy or email us actualastronomy at gmail.com. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks for uh, reaching out and having a conversation while my sound is poor and I'm really in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> right on. Thanks, Chris. And thanks everybody for listening. All right. Bye.